Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? And then as we pray together, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verse 6 through 8, the Apostle Paul is writing to his young friend of the faith, and he says, For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I fought the good fight, I finished the course, I've kept the faith. In the future there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Would you bow with me as we pray? Father God, as we pause this morning once again uh, to come together in corporate worship, I thank you for this day. Thank you for the breath of life that you've given each one of us here this morning and those that are listening. Thank you for the mobility that each of us have here this morning, that we are able to move about and have our being. Thank you, God, for our vision to be able to see when there are many people who cannot see this morning. Thank you, God, for the hearing ability that you've given us, that we're able to hear what the Spirit says to us today through your Word. God, I just thank you for your love, mercy, and grace. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who leads us into all truth, for the Holy Spirit who brings conviction to the lost soul, to the Holy Spirit for going to and from throughout this world this morning, searching the hearts of people to bring them to a saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for a world out there, some five point billion people plus that know you not as their personal Lord and Savior today. God, I pray, Holy Spirit of the living God, that you would move in such a way, O oh God, that it would bring people to a place of repentance, to a place of conversion. God, I pray that you would help us this morning, that we would look at our own lives, that we would search our own hearts, that, Father, we would just look through the very rooms of our hearts Many of those that are locked doors, that are locked away with things that we don't want to confront, things that we don't want to face. Pray, oh God, that you would give us power through the Holy Spirit, oh God, to reach out, to pull ourselves up to a place, oh God, where we can focus entirely and completely on you. Father, forgive us where we so fail you, where we fall so short of being all that we could be, all that you would want us to be. Father, I pray that you would help us this new year, Father, that we would just grow more in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ than we ever have had in the past. And God, I pray as we look around into a world today that is filled with a longing in their heart. Oh God, you created mankind with a vacuum, and that vacuum will never be filled until it's filled with the Spirit of the living God. Father, we realize this morning that man is ever searching. He glimpses the hills afar and plans for the things out yonder where all his tomorrows are. God, I pray that you would help us this day to realize that the most important thing in all of life is what legacy am I going to choose to leave this world with one of these days? Help us as we reflect upon that this morning. In Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Two Sundays ago, I began a series, a three-part sermon series on the question, what say you? What say I? Three big questions that each one of us have to come to a decision on, a choice on. Three big questions that you and I have to ask ourselves in this life. The first one we looked at two weeks ago today was, what Lord am I going to choose to love? Secondly, what life am I going to choose to live? And this morning... What legacy am I going to choose to leave 
behind. As you and I travel through this thing called life, you and I find ourselves wanting to hear certain words that are life challenging, but also are life changing. In fact, we want to hear someone say from some university, you've been accepted. Young people, that's probably something that's in the back of your minds this morning. As you go through your days of education, that one of these days you'll want to hear some college or some universal, university say that you've been accepted. Or maybe you want to hear the love of your life say to you, I do. Uh, maybe you want to hear the doctor say, all of your tests are great, it's benign. Maybe you want to hear the judge say, not guilty. Maybe you want to hear the IRS say, we owe you. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? You see, but there are six words this morning that I think are the most important of all. The, the Lord Jesus Christ, when you and I leave this life, there are six words I hope to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. You see, there are a lot of things in life that you and I don't get to decide on. We don't get to decide when we were born, where we were born, or who we were born to. We don't get to decide how tall we're going to be. We don't get to determine the color of our eyes, the color of our hair, the makeup of our DNA. We don't get to decide whether or not we die, we may choose when we die, how we die, and where we die. That is, if a person is suicidal, but we don't get to decide whether or not to die. You see, we do get to answer the three most important questions about the past, the present, and the future. We do get to make the three most important decisions and exercise the three most important choices to those questions and those decisions that determine our life from its beginning to its ending and even after it's over. And that first question that I asked two weeks ago is what, Lord, am I going to choose to love? Secondly, what life am I going to choose to live? And thirdly, for today, how will I answer this question? What choice will I make in the fact of what legacy am I going to choose to leave? What is it someday that you hope people remember about you? What is it someday that you hope people will be able to say positive about you? Let me tell you, what is it that you want people to remember about you? The impact that you made on their life, the influence that will outlive you and me someday. What will be your last breath? In the Bible, in the book of 2 Timothy, we find the apostles' words that we read a few moments ago. In fact, the Apostle Paul is getting ready to depart from this life, and he summarizes his life, and he gives his own epitaph, and it's one that I would think that everyone would love, and that is, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Will you Will I be able to say that at the end of life? You see, whenever, wherever, and however that may be one of these days, Paul has come to a realization that the sun, so to speak, is about to set on his life. Now, young people, I know for you, I sat where you are sitting one time many years ago, and I realized at your age you probably don't, think about these things. You probably think I'm young, I'm invincible, I have all of life before me. But I want you to know time has woven a realization for me of a fact that is so true and I read it all the time in newspapers everywhere and that's the ages of people that leave this life and the ages that they're leaving this life Paul said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he's writing to this young man, this young man called Timothy, someone that Paul has tried to teach. 
He's tried to school him. He's tried to be a great mentor to him. And Paul says to him, the time of my departure has come. That Greek word for departure is analysis, in which we get our English word. It literally means to unloose or untie. When you and I analyze something, we untie it, we separate it into its various parts, which Paul is trying to give you and me a picture of death. It's the only time it's used in all of the New Testament. You see, a prisoner would use it to refer to the removal of shackles or chains when he's set free. The farmer would use it to refer to the unyoking of an oxen at the end of the day's work so that that animal could rest. A soldier used it to refer to the striking of the tent, which would signify that the battle is over and there's peace at hand. The sailor would use that word to raise anchor and to set sail for home. You see, we all here this morning, we're all time-bound creatures. All of us face that departure. And Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 6, verse, uh, the A part of that verse, for I'm already being poured out, he said, as a drink offering, that word poured out, it comes from another Greek word, a spindome, which gives you and me the word spend. Every day of mine in your life, it's like money. We spend it. You can't save it. You can't store it. You have to spend it or not spend it wisely or foolishly. And the way we spend the days of our lives will determine the legacy that you and I choose to leave one of these days. So how would you leave your legacy? You can live life in such a way that at the end of the day you say, well, I have no remorse. I have no regrets. I have no reserves. I have no retreats. And I have no do-overs. You see, if you and I want to hear God say someday, well done, good and faithful servant, then you and I have to determine to do three things. Let me give them to you quickly this morning. Number one, be faithful to the fight. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4 verse 7, he said, I fought the good fight. Now, the word fought and the word fight they come from the same Greek word, uh, agon, which you and I would get our English word agony. It literally means a conflict. Lots of people do not like conflict, but if you become a follower of Jesus Christ, you have no choice because you and I become spiritual soldiers in God's army. You don't realize it, but the moment that you and I decide uh, that first question by saying, I'm going to choose to love the Lord. You and I get drafted into God's army. And let me tell you, you and I are immediately pulled into a fight. The moment you and I follow Jesus, there are three enemies at large, the world around you, the flesh inside of you, and the devil before you. Satan, sin, and self are going to fight you at every turn of life's road. The world will try to control you. The flesh will try to corrupt you. And Satan will try to condemn you. You see, that's the reason when you give your life to Jesus, you don't just become a saint, you become a soldier. And the problem is that a lot of people that follow Jesus, they either don't realize that there's a war going on or they aren't showing up for it. There was an Anglican bishop by the name of J.C. Ryle. He said something that is true this morning as it was when he stated it some 200 years ago. He said there are thousands of men and women who go to churches and chapels 
every Sunday and call themselves Christians. Their names are in the baptismal register. They are reckoned Christians while they live. They are married with a Christian marriage uh, service. They're buried as Christians when they die, but you never see any fight about their religion of spiritual strife and exertion and conflict and self-denial and watching and warring. They know literally nothing at all. Such Christianity, Ryle says, is not the Christianity of the Bible. It's not the religion uh, which the Lord Jesus founded and those apostles preached. True Christianity, J.C. Ryle said 200 years ago, true Christianity is a fight. The world will always try to get us to believe a lie and not the truth. And folks, let me tell you, if that's not true in the 21st century, on January the 29th, 2023, then I'm stupid. I want you to know, if that's not the truth, look around us. Look at what's changed. Look at what the Bible says and look what society is trying to push upon us. The world will always try to get us to believe a lie and not the truth. The flesh will always try to get us to do that which is wrong rather than that which is right. Satan is going to always try to get us to worship any God that this world puts out there but the one true God. I don't believe that we ought to go looking for a fight, but I do believe that when you make up your mind to live for Jesus, you don't have to go looking for the fight. I believe the fight comes looking for you and me. It's quite honestly too many followers of Jesus, I believe, are deserters, and we're seeing that all the time in this day and time. They go through their entire Christian life, and they, uh, they never fire a shot. They never weld a sword. They never take a stand this morning, I would be lying to you if I said, I think life's easy. I'd be truthfully lying if I said that. I'd be lying this morning to you if I said the battle is easy because it isn't. It's a tough battle. It's a tiring battle. It's a traumatic battle. But I agree with something that Vince Lombardi said once, the former coach of the Green Bay Packers, he said, I firmly believe that man's finest hour, his greatest fulfillment to all he holds dear, is the moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle, victorious. Let me ask you a question in the good fight this morning. Are you and I being victorious, even though it's tiring, even though it's traumatic at times? An amazing story I read about a Japanese soldier. This has always stuck in my mind, and, and uh, it really resonates, I think, a great story that is a true story, Haru Onoda. He was stationed in the Philippine islands of Lungbang. He had been given orders that no matter what happened, he was to stay and fight until the very end of his life. When Japan surrendered on September the 2nd, 1945, he didn't know it. And for the next 29 years, he kept fighting. He lived in the jungle. He would raid villages for rice and meat. He would kill people whom he thought were enemy combatants. It wasn't until 1974 when his commanding officer finally located him and relieved him of his duty. He became the last World War II combatant to surrender to the Allied forces. When he returned to Japan and the reporters asked him what he had been thinking about for those past 30 years, he said, I was carrying out orders. I was carrying out my orders. Let me tell you, a long time ago, Jesus gave some orders. He gave some orders to stay in the fight until he calls you and me home. 
Maybe you remember Johnny Erickson Tata, who was, she's a singer and she's been on many television programs. She's been on Billy Graham through the years. She was in a diving accident. She became a quadriplegic almost all of her life. She faces all kinds of physical upheavals, up and down battles every day of her life. And she made this statement one day about her life and the perplexity of it and all the grueling things that she had to live every day from that diving accident that totally destroyed what she thought her future would be she said, this is the only time in history when I get to fight for God. It's the only part of my eternal story when I'm actually in the battle. Once I die, I will be in celebration mode and a glorified body and a whole different set of circumstances. But this is my limited window of opportunity, and I'm going to fight the good fight for all I'm worth. Let me ask you a question. Whatever you're struggling with this morning, whatever I'm struggling with this morning, let me ask you a question. Is it the window of opportunity to fight the good fight? To say to the world, yes, life's tough, and yes, life's hard. And yes, there's all kinds of traumas, and there's all kinds of things to defeat me in life and to discourage me in life and to knock me down. You see, we could all say that this morning, but could we be like her and her quadriplegicness to be able to say this is my only window, my limited window of opportunity, and because of what's happened to me in my life, I choose to fight the good fight and to live out my days celebrating the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Secondly, this morning, not only be faithful to the fight, be faithful to the faith. Timothy, Paul said to Timothy in verse 7, I've kept the faith. I've kept the faith. That means, that word kept means to guard something like an armed soldier would guard his post against enemy attack. And what Paul means by the faith is what the apostle Jude referred to in Jude verse 3. And that was once and for all delivered to the saints. He's referring to the truth of God's word about the basic fundamental beliefs and the doctrines or the church, or the teachings that the church has held to for these 2,000 years. It would be, they are called today orthodox. Those basic fundamentals of the faith. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said, the chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without holiness, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, and heaven without hell. You see, that's even more true in this 21st century that you and I live in when I look at the church and the culture of the day, and I see more of the culture influencing the church than the church is influencing the culture. Folks, let me tell you, regardless of what culture dictates, regardless of what culture does. Let me tell you, for 2,000 years, the church has believed the Word of God. And God has commanded some things in here, and, and God has not changed those commandments and those mandates. And we may change the marriage act here in America, but God didn't change it. We may change abortion issues in America, but God didn't change it. God says it's murder. God says that every life is a valued life. And folks, let me tell you, regardless of what, what the world does, we will either be found in the last days of time being what is known as the Church of Philadelphia in the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, when those letters were written to those seven churches, will either be a true church, teaching, preaching, 
with love the truth and the veracity of the Scripture of what God says, or else we will be caught up into what is known as the Laodicean church, which goes along with culture and what the culture mandates and what the culture dictates and what the culture wants you and I to do. Oz Guinness, uh, a great writer, it's surely... He said, it's surely undeniable that only rarely in Christian history has the lordship of Jesus in the West been treated as more pliable or has Christian revisionism been more brazen. Christian interpretations of the Bible, more self-serving. Christian preaching, more soft. Christian behavior, more laxed. Christian compromise more common. Christian directions from the faith, defections from the faith more casual, and Christian rationale for such slippage more spurious and shameless. You see, nowhere is the faith that we're talking about being challenged more than it is young people in the field of education. I want you to know one study by Harvard University and George Mason University professors, it was found in that study that out of those professors, 52% of college professors regard the Bible as an ancient book of fables, legends, history, and moral precepts. But that number increased to 73% when professors of elite universities were surveyed. Furthermore, the percentage of atheist and agnostic professors in America is three times greater than that of the general population. I want you to know, young people, it's a hard road to hoe out there. It's a hard road to hoe because of the changes this world is seeing. But I want you to know, being faithful to the truth and to God's truth is what's important. Woodrow Wilson once said, I'd rather lose in a cause that will someday win than to win in a cause that will someday lose. Thirdly and lastly, and I'm finished this morning, be faithful to the fight, be faithful to the faith, be faithful to the finish. Timothy said, or Paul said to Timothy in concluding in verse 7, I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. God has given you a race to run. God has given me a race to run. I can't run your race. You can't run my race, but we're all in a race this morning. And if you know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, every finisher is a winner. I want you to know God isn't concerned with how fast we run, but he's con- he is concerned about how far we run. It's not how you start the race that matters. It's how you and I finish the race that counts. Life isn't a sprint. Life is a marathon out there, and all of us need to finish the race. I don't know about you. I like all genres of music. I like everything from the blues to pop to country to, uh, now I don't like opera, but, but I do like classical music. It was really interesting that I used this illustration in the sermon because this last week on the television, this just happened to be on. For, for those of you that do like classical music, one of the most famous uh, symphonies that was written in musical history is a symphony that was never finished. In fact, the Austrian composer Franz Schubert, he wrote the famous symphony number no. eight in B minor, which is also known as the Unfinished Symphony. He started it, uh, but he left it with only two movements. And even though uh, Schubert lived another six years, he never finished Symphony Number 8 
in B minor. Now, you and I, this morning, were writing our own symphony. I would say, don't leave it unfinished. Make sure you write the last note. Keep your eye on the prize. Notice what Paul said in verse 8, in the future, there is laid up for me. In the future, we get so caught up in the present, the now and now, that we fail to remember what's coming, the future. In the future, Paul says to Timothy, his young friend, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. But notice what he said. And not to only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. You see, if you and I love the right Lord, if we live the right life, we will leave the right legacy. Earlier in this sermon, I referenced Oz Guinness. I have lots of his books, and he was a brilliant writer. He said one day he went to visit a great Anglican preacher and teacher. In fact, he's one of my favorites also, John R. W. Stott. Before he died, Oz Guinness went to see him. They spent an hour together, and when Oz Guinness started to leave, he turned to R.W. Stott, and he said, how would you like for me to pray for you? R.W. Stott was now bedridden. He was barely able to speak above a whisper, and he said, pray that I will be faithful to Jesus until my last breath that I will be faithful to Jesus until my last breath. A couple of weeks ago, over at Hack's house, I went by to see his precious wife. She was dying. Kelly and Mike were there. We gathered around her bed. We prayed for her. She had lived a life of faith. She knew where she was going. She longed to be in a place called heaven where she would forever be well. This past Thursday, I was at the nursing home. I'd walked into Toddy Carter Hartzell's room. Her two sons were there, Mike and Danny, and I. We gathered around Toddy's bed. She was gasping. I prayed, Lord, let her come into your presence. We had just talked about that this was what she had lived for, 91 years. She had lived for this day when she could go to be in the presence of the Lord Jesus. We prayed. We turned from the bed to talk. Her boys were talking about how much they loved their mom, what she had meant to them, that they had been in Sunday school all their lives growing up and and as we were talking we were talking about False Creek and all of those kinds of times and we looked over and while we were talking she just left the room and she was in the presence of Jesus folks let me tell you what legacy will you leave behind one of these days what's really important when it's all said when it's all done, when you have to leave behind all of your earthly possessions, you have to leave them all here. What really counts? What really matters the most? I would encourage each one of us here this morning to live a life that would be pleasing so that someday when you enter heaven's portals, you can hear the master say, well done, well done, my good and faithful servant. Let me tell you, there's lots of things I'm not. I'd be the first to admit my faults. There's a lot of things that I'm not. But there's one thing that I can confidently say that I am. I'm a child of the king 
and I've tried my best to be faithful. All I want to hear is well done, good and faithful servant. Would you stand as we pray together? Father God, as we have soberly listened to the words that Paul left behind, I pray, God, these words will speak to our hearts. Some way, somehow, God, you would use them to bring honor and to bring glory to your kingdom's work. Because when it's all said and when it's all done, that's what it's going to boil down to. What did we do for you while we were here? Oh God, I realize many people will stand before you. God saved, really never did anything for you beyond that. Their rewards will just be burned up. Or they did them all for the wrong reasons. Or God, we will be rewarded, whatever that means, someday. God, most of us live life as if we're just going to be in this present existence forever. We try to fill our lives with all kinds of stuff, stuff that According to the Bible, it's all going to burn one these days. And the most important thing is what we do in the here and the now will determine the then and the there. Help us, God, that we might reevaluate, reanalyze, re examine where we are, who we are and what we are and what we could be if we choose to be that for you. Father, this is your invitation. I've done my best. Holy Spirit, it's up to you if someone makes a decision, whether here in the sanctuary or driving down the road listening to this broadcast or somebody that will tune in this week to the website and listen. Holy Spirit, your word does not return void. And so as Proverbs says, where the tree falls, there it shall lay. Where the word falls today, there it shall lay. So Holy Spirit, according to your purposes, use it for your glory and for your honor. In Christ's name we pray.